This episode of Tales from the Lot is sponsored by ShakedownT-Shirts.com. With unique lot-style t-shirts, license plate frames, coffee mugs, and all sorts of things for Grateful Dead, Fish, Zappa, Panic, and more. ShakedownT-Shirts.com, where all U.S. orders over $35 ship free. And just for Tales from the Lot listeners, use the code LOT20 for 20% off of any order. That's L-O-T-2-0. I'm back, and it's Tales from the Lot, the first episode of Season 2. Jerry had his game face on. My guest Gary Kerper is here to talk about the infamous 5877 show at Barton Hall, Cornell University. Here we go. Hi, welcome to Tales from the Lot. This is Will. My guest today is Gary Kerper from New York. We're going to be talking about 5877 and whether that show actually happened or not. So how's it going, Gary? Good, thanks. How you doing, Will? I'm doing fantastic. So uh, where did you, where did you come from musically? What were you into growing up and... And, and how did you, you arrive to this, this Grateful Dead thing? Well, in high school, I was mostly into the classic stuff, the Beatles, the Stones, Allman Brothers, really big, uh, Zeppelin, Dylan, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. And the Dead were kind of, um, they, were, they were kind of like uh, underground. I, they weren't that popular, especially with the people I was hanging out with. Interesting. Yeah, that's and, and you know these days they're all that whole circle. You can't really say without mentioning the Grateful Dead. So that's that's cool. So you had some friends into it that, that said, "Hey, you should come check this thing out." Or how did how did that work? No, no, actually, um, uh, it was freshman year in college, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, meeting new new people, and uh, we were hanging out with one one guy who had older brothers and sisters who had seen the dead at Roosevelt Stadium in 72 and 73 and 74. And he was playing Europe 72 constantly. So we were hanging out in this guy's room and he's playing that. And we were like, this sounds pretty good. Yeah. Really good. No so, doubt. so that was like my first real introduction to, to the dead. Although backtracking when I was in camp and when I was 11 years old in 1970 in that summer my counselors were playing working man's dead so I vividly remember them playing uncle John's band that was like my first introduction but it didn't really sink in back then it was a pretty cool song back then but I I didn't really you know absorb it and understand you know it was kind of the, the seed that was planted that, that, that sprouted <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so you're in college, and, and and people obviously, you know, they were a, a big college thing through the '70s, '80s, and, and on into the '90s. And so, uh, where did you first see them at? Well, no, Cornell was my first show. Oh, oh, okay, gotcha. Cornell was my oh. first show. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. so we were listening to the, to the Europe 72 and I think someone else had sc- uh, skeletons from the closet and mm-hmm. you know I I, I I you know but but then we had different people li- you know listening to uh, Bob Marley we had one group listening to Aerosmith one group listening to Boston one group listening to uh, Hendrix and Al Dimiola so we everybody had their own you know musical uh, influences uh, that, all, every one of those is fantastic in that era though you know like yeah i mean yeah. You, you could frown upon aerosmith these days but back then they were a pretty solid band yeah 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 so so then it was the spring and it was like school was ending and the one guy who had the older brothers and sisters he said um you're not going to believe it the dead are playing at cornell on sunday like the two days after school was ending and let's go. So I'm like, okay, let's do it. I'm always in rushing to go home to like a like a, a job or something like that. You know, it was mm-hmm. my uh, freshman year of college. Right. I don't even know if I was working. You know, if I had a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not on your radar sometimes at that age. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe I was paint, painting houses or something like that. But um, so we got permission from the school to stay in the dorms over the weekend because the show was Sunday night. So we just kind of squatted in our dorm the Saturday and the Sunday. And we went up to Cornell on, uh, I forgot who got the tickets. I know, I know I, I personally didn't get them. I think my buddy got them. 
-hmm. and we went up there on at noon on Sunday for the show Got with it. about yeah, I was I about six or eight guys. On, gotcha. I looked it up on uh, DeadNet um, just to see if there were notes and, and other comments on there, and they had the price listed as seven fifty. So uh, yeah, so evidently it was you know sub eight dollars to go see the Grateful Dead in those days, which is kind of cool. And and here I was bitching in 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 ninety two or ninety three of, of spending twenty five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah it's it, all it's all uh, relative inflation it for is. sure it is yeah yeah it's in. yeah still going so yeah so cool so you uh, got the tickets and uh that's awesome they let you spend the night at the in the dorms and, and yeah so we went up there like at noon that. we we went up there early and we just hung out so the barton hall is this uh, big airplane kind of hangar and we okay. we um went up there and there were three sets of doors um on like the south uh end of the of the hall um where 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 they were letting people in and um mm -hmm. some people had sleep slept out overnight i guess they came from boston from the night before or they just would just oh, yeah. whatever uh they were there when we got there at noon we we're like whoa you know these people are here already you know we, we thought yeah. we'd be the, only, the first people there but there were some <laughs> people in front of each door not a lot but there was some yeah you and know if you were we at did, that boston show there's no doubt you were going to go to the next one that, that's that was a hot one too you know yeah it was it was <laughs> yeah and, so, uh, so yeah there's a bunch of people there already huh not that many but then as the afternoon uh got got going more and more people started milling around in the plaza there and then by like five o'clock there was a lot there was a few there was a few thousand there so we um, we had gone to the bathroom, I think, earlier, and then we we were like, we better not go anywhere. We better stay by the doors. Right. And and GA, and, and right. What's that? A general mission. Yeah, it was general mission for sure. Yeah. yeah. And now it's like it started out as a pretty nice day, and now it's around five thirty, six o'clock, and the clouds start rolling in, and it starts drizzling. And it starts getting a little breezy and chilly hmm. and we're getting cold. And now it's like, when, when, when are they going to open up the doors? And then finally they open up the doors and they had these big blue garbage cans, like on each side of the door to try to funnel the people in, gotcha. uh, you know, somewhat organized. But hmm. let me tell you, well, when they open up the doors, the, well, the set of doors that I was in front of, all hell broke loose. It was like a free for all. People were jumping over the garbage cans, oh, you know, to try to get in first. And then there was like, you know, the animal instinct in you takes over. You just want to get in as fast as you can. You right. know, it's like the competitive nature, and you just want, okay, okay, is this how we're going to do this? Let's let's get in fast. So <laughs> finally, when they opened the doors, they were like, there was a short uh, flight of steps, and I just beelined it right for the front. So I was right smack in the front against the stage oh. basically wow nice so yeah. you were one of those getting horribly smashed <laughs> no doubt no doubt <laughs> very cool so uh wow so um okay so outside you know i, I didn't start going to the 90s and and you know we, we we know what shakedown turned into what what was what was the outside scene like at that time i mean were it was were people pretty relaxed cheeses or, or what was going on no there was no, not really it was just people just hanging around and People were mostly friendly and and yeah, it was there was, there's no there was no tailgating scene. I know this is tales from the lot, but this is this, <laughs> this, this story is more from tales from the front. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 no doubt. I was just you know I was just curious because you know uh, and, and when that and when that happened, you know, do you, I mean, you saw a few shows from from then to till the end, and, and so what, more than a few about when the when the the commercial shakedown flip was. I don't know. I mean, you know, I started, you know, of course I saw a lot of the, sh the, the shows in the East, you know, in New Haven mm -hmm. and Hartford and Nassau Coliseum and Brendan Byrne Arena. I think, you know, just, and then the, I, I I think once, um, once they started filling out, filling up the arenas, people started just setting up camps outside in the, in the parking yeah. lot. And and then as it got bigger and bigger, you can, you know, buy sandwiches and buy shirts and buy pretty much everything outside in the parking yeah, lot. Once there's enough people there, there's, uh, there's somebody's going to realize it's a market. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sar- yeah. Saratoga. Yeah. I, I listened. I listened to the to the tales from a lot from the guy who went to Saratoga. Yeah, I was there too. Uh-huh. Not in '83. Yeah. I went '84, '85, <laughs> and '88 to Saratoga. Gotcha. Yeah, that was that was a great place. Yeah. Okay, so your front row at the the greatest Grateful Dead show ever. Like, so uh, can I ask your state uh, of being in? And I was <laughs> at the time. You know, I was pretty. I was pretty coherent. Yeah. I was pretty coherent. They were cool. passing around, you know, passing around joints. Um, and I was pretty coherent, except um, what happened was some people had passed around some bad stuff and people mm-hmm. were, were like just passing out, right? Mm-hmm. Like on the floor. So that's why Bob okay. Weir is looking down with, a, with wonderment saying, what are you guys doing down there? You're supposed to be enjoying yourself, not passing <laughs> out. And... But they kept playing, and I was just just looking up, right? You know, Jerry had his game face on, and it was mind-boggling. I didn't even know half the songs, frankly, because, you know, they weren't all on Europe 72. Yeah, you know? yeah there was a... Uh, I'm trying to think what, like, they might... Uh, uh, they Love Each Other might have been? Jack Straw? Yeah, well, Jack Straw is on Europe 72, but They Love Each Other, songs like that, I didn't really know. And and Road Jimmy and Lazy Lightning, and, but it it all sounded great. And then they did the the dancing in the streets, and oh. the place was just rocking. And we were just holding on <laughs> for dear life. And and we just we we knew it, it, whatever they were doing, it was good. It was really good. Right. Yeah, it was definitely a special night. So the the first set, yeah, there's no there's no slacks there. But but once that Scarlet Fire comes, I mean, like everybody i'm sure knew that this was a special night because i was i mean man that was killer yeah 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 it was it was it was phenomenal and then when you listen to it now on the tape it's just pure magic every every note but the cool thing was before they went into the saint stephen jam they huddled up for like at least five minutes discussing what they were doing the game plan what they were going to play and that was pretty cool yeah you know they were they were all like discussing which you know which uh, medley they were going to do. Nice. And it was, uh, it was just ridiculous. It was just, Jerry was right in front. I was right smack in the front. When, uh, when Jerry uh, did one more Saturday night at the end, when he just did, you know, went wild, Mm -hmm. he jumped, he jumped six inches off the ground. I didn't, I didn't know he had, I didn't know he had those kind of springs in his feet, but he, he jumped at the end. I mean, they were definitely psyched. Right. And so, okay. So of that night, um, you know, for me listening back to it, 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 maybe it would be the morning dew or something, but, but what was the moment when, when you decided, you know, that night, that this was for you and you were probably going to do this some more. I mean, it was, you know, I was very impressionable, you know, I'm 18 years old and it was like, you know, I was into all kinds of other music and all pretty much open-minded. It was, it was just, wow. And then I got out of the show and it was snowing. You probably heard the stories. There was like three inches of snow on the ground. There was, there was the whole, the whole night was crazy. But after I left the show the next day, I have two younger brothers. So my middle brother, I said, you can't believe this concert that I saw. It was unbelievable. It was grateful. You, you can't believe it. It was unbelievable how good they were, you know? So I was started listening to uh, some of the um, some of the tapes. I had an eight track player actually in my dad's mm-hmm. old Mercury Cougar. So I had Great American Music Hall. I had a few random shows on eight tracks. I'm not sure how I recorded them, but I had them on eight. <laughs> and I just was listening. I had Europe seventy two, so I was listening over and over, and just you know learning more of the words. And then my brother actually went to English Town for his first show. Uh-huh. And and he was out of out of you know him and all his friends were just like what happened you know they were they were in shock just like I was after Cornell they were in utter shock so then you know then you start listening to the music and then when I went back to school in the fall I met some guys who were trading tapes there was a guy one guy who I met at Cornell who I drove back to campus he turned out to be like one of the first tape traders on campus. This guy, Rick Sullivan, he, li- he lives in, um, he lives in uh, Vermont now. And I just spoke to him the other day. He, um, 
So he was making, he had tapes. So this is uh -huh. fall of 77 and I'm walking by his dorm room and he's playing Winterland 3 1977. I'm like, wow, that sounds good. Where's that from? And he mm -hmm. had Springfield 77. He had a bunch of, you know, live tapes. Wow. So then it just, you know, it just kind of snowballs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, they didn't have taper section then you just kind of, I mean, did they, did they care that you were taping that like the venue people or, or how, how would, do you know anything about how that was being handled back then? It's, there were some people taping the Cornell show. There were some people. Mm -hmm. And then my second show was Colgate, 11-4, and there were definitely a few people taping that show. Okay. And if you saw it, they probably weren't hassling them too much. Not though. at all. Yeah. Not at yeah. all. That's cool. Yeah. I was curious how that was all handled back back then. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think it was pretty lax. I don't think they, you know, I think people snuck them in, yeah. but I don't think they cared much. Yeah. <laughs> and then right, Colgate <laughs> was another show. Yeah, thank God. And then Colgate was unbelievable because one of my friends who had gone to Cornell, his brother was going to Colgate. And he says, he said, guys, you're not going to believe it. Uh, my brother just called. The Dead just announced the show on Tuesday. They're playing Friday at, at Colgate in the gymnasium. We're like, okay, <laughs> get tickets. So he got tickets. I think they might have been $5, seriously, with, uh, with, with, his, uh, with his geo card. And so we drove to Colgate, which was like, I don't know, an hour drive, an hour and a half drive from Ithaca. And it was in the gymnasium. Will, I don't know how big your high school gymnasium was, but this was place was smaller than my high school gymnasium. And we walked in like a little, like one of those, you know, doors that you push in, like, and mm -hmm. 10 feet in front of the, the, the stage for, for Colgate. And it was just like, wow. And they just blew the, blew the, blew the door, the doors out that one right are you are you a donna fan um not a huge donna fan but you know i appreciate her and i i i, I you know when i listen yeah i mean yeah she's yeah. she's fine with me yeah uh, yeah, um, but yeah she's of that era she it fits in with it and, and just makes it without it it would certainly be different yeah so yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I i'm good with donna yeah i'm fine it's better than yoko <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how many did you make it to overall? Like, how many how many dead shows did you see? I would say about one hundred and five. Wow. I, I tailed off in the in the nineties. In, mm -hmm. in the nineties, I tailed I tailed off. I started, but I was pretty pretty consistent. I was seeing you know a couple of shows in the spring, a couple of shows in the fall. My brother moved to California, so I went out there. I saw New Year's in eighty eight. I saw him at the Greek Theater in 87, Sacramento, uh, Cal Expo, and I went down to Irvine. I saw them there a couple of nights. But I wasn't like a I, – if I was like a hardcore traveler, I would have probably seen 300. But I, I was – I had a job. I, I was I was a responsible deadhead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you work to get to go to those shows. I, 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 was a, I was at some show. I don't remember what it was, but some guy does – I was at Red Rocks and he stands up and he turns around and yells to everybody up the way, this is why we work. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah you're kind of right. <laughs> the guy was having the time of his life for sure. I can't, I can't remember what it was like J rad or something. It was funny. And then, so, okay. So you, uh, you saw him all through the eighties and everything. What, what are some of the standouts? I mean, obviously this first one, it's, you know, it's tough to, to top that one, but what are, what are your summer your standouts or uh, any, uh, Cool stories you have from well, any of the shows. Well, seen. I would say Rochester eleven five seventy seven was unbelievable. We yeah. went up there, and it was it was like that Ohio Ohio scene where 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 all those people got crushed to death at the, the like a Who concert or something like that. Uh -huh. I mean, I got lifted off my feet and like carried into that place. It was it was nuts because it was cold outside, and they finally opened the doors. All the ticker takers scattered, and we just got like blown in. It was really, it was dangerous. Yeah, I was like peeling like, my yeah. leg off with one of the turnstiles. <laughs> Yikes! And then it was general admission, so the whole floor we were just off the off the off the floor, pretty close to the mm -hmm. stage. It was right, right. We, we were a perfect spot, but the floor was just back and forth. It was a sea of people, and you know you hear Jerry saying. 
<laughs> you know, people getting horribly smashed and, you know, <laughs> you know, have mercy, you know, on, on these, because it was just, it was the, just the sea of people. It was, it was pretty crazy. And that show was just high octane from the beginning. It was amazing. Well, yeah, that's, that's when they were really causing a frenzy. The dead were. That was, that, that was a standout. The New Haven one that I went to in 78, May 10th, 1978. Unbelievable. The place was just shaking. Jer Jerry was out of control that night. I would say 111.79 stands out. Mm -hmm. um, I went to those two. I was home for, for a mid-college mid, mid college break in, ja in early January, you know, Christmas. And I went to see them January 10th where they broke out the Dark Star. But the next night, I thought was was bet. The next night, I was I, I was out of control. It was uh, that show was unbelievable. One eleven seventy nine. Listen, listen to the audience tape on re-listen. It's it's unreal. I'm gonna write it down. Yeah, try to check it out. That one I was in an uh, altered state. The, 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 <laughs> that might that might have had something to do with it, but um, it was uh, it. it was pretty pretty amazing. I'll give it a spin. So okay, so so back to five eight seventy seven. You've heard the, the, the or seen the, the the theory on the internet uh, that some lunatic made up. Obviously, <laughs> it's so ridiculous. But it, it, I, I read it today just because it's been a few years since <laughs> I read it. It's still hilarious as it ever was about CIA testing and. <laughs> and, and All right, I just got to take a minute and read this crazy shit that's been floating around on the internet forever about this. Cornell show. So here we go. I understand why most people think that 5877 was as real as can be. It's widely considered to be the holy grail of Grateful Dead shows. And if it was an actual real show, it would be just that. But the fact is that it was a hoax perpetrated through a joint effort of the U.S. Department of Defense and the CIA. And this is nothing new. My uncle served in NAM with one of the guys that were actually in the CIA experiment. Hell, if you don't believe me, it's even on the archive. Okay, so I'm not sure what archive he's talking about here, but I'll continue. There's been a lot of talk lately about the legendary fake show of 5877, and I've kept my silence on the subject for 22 years. Now it's finally time to come clean on the whole subject. The whole idea began back in late 69 or early 1970. The Department of Defense and the CIA were very disappointed by the way the Vietnam War was progressing. Not only were we losing, but more importantly, the U.S. public did not approve of the war and worse yet, weren't believing anything the military said about what was happening. This was an unprecedented event. Any other recent war was viewed positively by the public, or at least with apathy in the case of Korea. Something had to be done. They decided to take a page from the Soviets and experiment with mind control. Together with Disney and a fledgling computer company called Microsoft, they set out to prove that brainwashing could really work on the very people who opposed them. The hippies. It isn't widely known, but Cornell was actually the second test of these mind control procedures. The first occurred in mid-1975 and was a dismal failure. Two major mistakes were made. First, they picked the one time that the dead were not touring, and this created all sorts of problems with the subject audience. The more serious mistake was in not updating the criteria of this experiment. Due to typical government inefficiency, they used the 1969 version of the dead that was playing when the program was conceived. The sudden appearance of Pigpen, who had died two years earlier, literally blew the minds of those in attendance. Six months were spent erasing all traces of the show and carefully rebuilding as much of their minds as possible. The subjects were eventually released, and most of them became evangelists, their only lingering memory of the whole experiment being an unshakable belief that they had witnessed a true miracle. Unfortunately, no tapes have been found from this first experiment. That's a real shame because the version of Dark Star, St. Stephen, Eleven, Love Light that they used was supposedly the best ever. After a few drinks, the original scientists still speak in awe about the music they heard that day. By November 1976, everyone was ready for the second test. This time, they learned from their mistakes. A small group of college students were hired to attend shows from 1976 through 1977. Our job was to collect tapes of dead performances, select which tunes to use, and to help identify subjects for the upcoming experiment. The location and date were chosen with equal care. It was an off day during the tour and the location close enough to the real concerts to be believed. Of more importance was the late snowfall that day. That unusual and easily confirmed event provided the glue that would hold the implanted memories together. Even now, 22 years later, 
People remembering that concert use identical words to describe leaving the show. Hmm. Overall, the experiment was a great success. Of course, some people were given slightly different memories. Some, like Teddy Goodbear, remember taping the show and were even provided audience tapes to further cement the hoax. Still, others remember getting horribly smashed up front. None of this actually occurred. A week after the concert experiment, a second test was done on the town of Cornell itself. In order to perfect this hoax, the town itself must also be convinced that the concert took place. Disney had acquired ownership of all the local TV and radio stations through dummy corporations. Using special chips developed by Microsoft, they played subliminal messages to every man, woman, and child in a 100-mile radius of Barton Hall. For the most part, this programming still holds today, although some people did prove resistant to the message. As far as the source of the music, for the most part, the list posted by Brew Ziggins is correct. The only mystery remaining is the Scarlet Fire. That was actually performed by the dead specifically for this experiment. Since Jerry worked for the CIA, it was easy to convince him and the rest of the band to go along. Plus, he liked the idea of pranking a large group of people like this. The fabled 2677 Take a Step Back rehearsal tape is also from material tape for these experiments. So just a quick note uh, about Bruce Ziggins that was mentioned there. Um, this person has posted a list of all the songs from the Cornell show and the corresponding actual show that that song was taken from. Uh, I did notice the Scarlet Fire does not have uh, an alternate date listed, so as the uh, story here says, that one was made specifically for the show. Uh, so I'll continue here. The soundboard tapes in circulation were leaked by Betty O'Connell, who edited the original tapes. I don't know if it was just a coincidence or not, but they were leaked at about the same time as the tapes recorded by Betty Cantor were found. In any event, they became part of the so-called Betty Boards. Leaking these tapes also provided the first cracks in the hoax to appear since the tapes were distributed to people who were not in the experiment and who knew that no show was performed that day. It was necessary to obtain their silence through blackmail, bribery, and in extreme cases, mind control itself. That's also how the show came to be listed in all the popular dead show guides like Dead Base. So, what's happened to these mind control techniques used in the experiment? Microsoft has used this power to become one of the biggest, most influential companies in history. They sure didn't become that big by providing quality products. It was used to shape public reaction to the Gulf War. It's also clear that George Bush never understood the full power of these methods. There are also indications that this technology might explain the otherwise unbelievable popularity of rap music. That's the whole story. Okay, so that's the end. Uh, take it for what it's worth. Um... It's a good laugh for me. Let's get back to Gary. <laughs> I'm living proof that it really happened, that the show happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they've, and they've got a, they've actually got a whole list of, of the whole set list and where each of the songs came from. And, and, and if you listen there, some of them are actually kind of close, but it's obviously not the right ones. And, and, uh, I don't know. It just makes it all the more funny. I think that somebody really took the time, and then I was dumb enough to go listen to see. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm living proof that it really did happen. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So, and then '80s. Did you you saw you were saying you saw some West Coast shows and? Yeah, I would say the Greek Theater in in '87. Um, my brother was living in Berkeley. Went over there. The, the Watchtower show, the second the second day, it was like a five o'clock start, and they broke out the Watchtower in the second set, and we were just like, the whole place was like a swirl. We didn't know what hit us. It was like a, it was like a hurricane came through, and then everybody <laughs> walked out after the show, and it was like, what was that? It was like, it was like, a, it was like really a hurricane hit. And I walked out, I'll never forget, I'm walking down the steps, everybody's spilling out on that University Avenue on in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And I said to my brother, I said, was that Jerry or was that Hendrix? <laughs> and some guy, and I, back then I was like 30 at the time, some guy said, who was like 60, who was like my age, he said, I don't know, but I'll be back tomorrow to find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well put. <laughs> yeah, he, he just, man, Jerry could just rip sometimes, like, 
And and sometimes it's in the most subtle of places. It's like in the middle of Mexicali when when Bob's singing, he'll just be like doing the most crazy stuff that's you know to just knock you out. You know. <laughs> yeah, I was listening to some of the recommendations from some of your other podcasts for for a couple of these '90s shows. I listened to that one where where uh, Vince's first show where they did that bird song. I was like, wow, because I don't listen to much of the recent stuff at all. Mm -hmm. I listen to just mostly '70s tapes right. and shows, and I was like, whoa. It was great. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, I can't, it may have been that one, but there was, there was one where they were just starting to use the MIDI stuff and, and like, wow, you know, it just, it opened up a whole new palette for everybody and, and, uh, you know, they, it allowed them to keep progressing and changing and, uh, but, you know, which, I don't know, which surprises me about Dead and Company. Like, I feel like in the spirit of the dead, they should keep progressing and writing new songs, but, you know, they do what they want to do. <laughs> I'm not the manager of Dead and Company. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not Bobby. Do you see those guys at all? I haven't seen Dead and Company. I just kind of avoid, you know, City Field or big big venues. But I do go see Dark Star mm -hmm. Orchestra. Right. Re really, really like Jeff Matson, mm -hmm. and I've seen J I've seen J Rad. Right. Uh, a few times, but I prefer Dark Star Orchestra. I really like. I mean, and the last time we saw them they it was the best i've seen them they really really killed it yeah so I, I enjoy that i haven't seen them for a few years i i, I was in I'm in a band here in colorado we were lucky enough to open for them at uh state bridge um, mm -hmm. amphitheater here in colorado it was really cool that's the last time i've seen them. but i did see and i need to listen to it that bobby played with them a couple of weeks ago in san francisco i think it was mm -hmm. um, and i've been wanting to check that out but i haven't yet just to see how that went but yeah they're great guys and uh I really enjoyed every time I've seen him. Yeah, sure. I mean, I like John Mayer, and I, I just, I just don't want to go. I just don't, don't want to go to to uh, to a big venue like that, the Shea State uh, City Field for the, the concert. Yeah, I, avoid yeah. big crowds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to yeah, see I Wilco. I, I'm going to see Wilco sure. at the uh, United Palace in Manhattan uh, in a couple of months. I, I do like that band. That, that band's really good. Cool. Yeah. I see, uh, I see fish sometimes here at, at Dick's when they come through and, and I get to, I, I, I go out to Red Rocks quite a bit and just see random acts from like, you know, I saw Crosby, Stills, Nash a few years ago and, uh, you know, like Chic was awesome dance party, you know, and, and Trey comes through there sometimes and all kinds of people. So I live pretty close to that, but I don't, I don't get to huge shows too often. There's not a lot of those huge bands that I like these days, you know, like I'm not going to go see. I don't, I don't even know. You who, too. But... <laughs> yeah, you too. Probably not or anything like that. Um, maybe Springsteen. I might go see Springsteen if he came through. <laughs> That'd be yeah. about it. Yeah. He, he, he doesn't leave anything out. He doesn't leave anything uh, uh, behind for sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What else do you see? Wilco, who else do you see? I mean, what are you into these days? Um, I'm in, really into Richard Thompson. I don't know if you know him, the uh, the English folk uh, guitarist. Um, I'm a big Richard Thompson fan. I like mm -hmm. this uh, jam band called Donna the Buffalo. They they happen yes, to I, be from upstate New York. I have heard them, but, but uh, I'm I'm a little I'm a so, somewhat limited. I mean, I would see Springsteen yeah. for sure if, they, if, they get, <laughs> for sure. if I can get tickets. Right? Yeah, no doubt they'd, they'd be five hundred dollars probably. So. Probably, I actually saw Springsteen at the at Barton Hall, uh, oh, yeah? in I think in seventy eight, probably in seventy eight. Yeah, yeah, the year the the next year, yeah, he played in Barton Hall. So that wasn't the, quite the, the wild, band, but it was the, good. <laughs> the wild and the, the the something and the innocent tour or something. What is that? I'm no, I think correct. it was. Um, I think it was. Um, it's escaping me. Yeah, yeah, it was good. <laughs> whatever it was, I'm sure. Yeah. No, <laughs> you it was. Can't be it like was. 70s, it yeah, that's awesome. So, okay. So, uh, you know, I'd like to wrap these things up with like a recommendation, whether it's like a, you know, a book or a TV show or something that you think that, that people out there would enjoy, um, you know, it's a, an album or what's, what's something that's, that's changed your life besides the Grateful Dead <laughs> or, or made an impact or made you think. Well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pretty, pretty big reader. I just read two books that were really well written. One is uh, an ugly truth about Facebook. 
mm-hmm. about just how they really focus on ad revenue as <laughs> not so much on on internet security. Right. That was a really, really well written book. I recommend that. And then I read the book on the Sacklers and the opioid uh, fiasco mm-hmm. called the, the, called the Empire of Pain. Okay, that was unbelievable book really well written and really a really sad you know state of affairs as you as you know and i just read yeah. today where i think they have to pay like six billion dollars i mean they made billions but right. um and both of those <laughs> kind of come back to the same thing you know about ads and and revenue and profits and greed whatever it takes yeah whatever People, it takes a lot of greed in society these days for sure yeah and uh, as as we're seeing in the news today, as a matter of fact, <laughs> but uh, awesome. All right, Gary, thank you. Um, it's pretty amazing. I think we have some uh, proof that 5877 actually happened. We have somebody who was actually there. <laughs> I, I appreciate you coming on and talking about it. No problem. My, my, my pleasure. I, ha- I have a few other witnesses if, if, you, if you need like a, <laughs> another one. <laughs> Have him, have him give me a call. I'd love to have him on the show. <laughs> I, I got a couple of people to vouch for me. Awesome. I did want. Right. I did want to. I did want to do do one shout out. Um, sure. Because in, in some of your um, podcasts, you know, you, you talk about the relationships that you develop. Right. Back in the, um, I guess, the late seventies, early eighties, they had um, ads in the back of the Golden Road and relics where you can start trading tapes. So one, someone who I became friends with back then through tape trading, who I still communicate with regularly today, Brian O'Connell, he was living in Chicago. So he was my tape connection in Chicago. Uh-huh. And we're the same age. And he's he saw all the uptown theater shows in Chicago. He saw all the Alpine Valley shows. Now he moved, moved to Florida. But he happens to play in a band as well. But he, um, we've been friends for, you know, whatever, 40 years. And he, he uh, you know, you know, he used to he started burning me CDs when everything switched over to CDs. But back in the day, he was spinning cassettes, Maxell tapes, and sending them out. It was uh, <laughs> so you develop these relationships nice. insane, it really yeah, insane. Yeah, yeah, and I've said it before that this band has that 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 power to change your life and to, yeah, form those kind of relationships. Speaking of those Maxells. Uh, where'd it go? I just, I was going to show you, I was just going through something the other day and found some old tapes. And, and the, do you remember those points where you like send in your points to get max L tapes? Like <laughs> vaguely. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you get like 10 points per cassette or something like that. You put them yes. all in the paper and send them in and they'd send you 10 tapes. Yeah. I came across one. <laughs> was the other day. It was like, <laughs> yes. you can still that cash them in. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was wondering, where do I send these now to get my, Maybe they'll send me CDs now or something. Who knows? <laughs> awesome. All right, Gary, thank you so much for being on. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Will. Hey, now, do you have a great story about a Grateful Dead show you were at? I'd love to hear it and maybe have you on the podcast. Send me an email at will at org and let me know what show you would like to talk about and what made it so special to you.